Jesus alone. All God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. So when I was a kid, we had a principal. He was a, a little skinny thing, but that guy could wield a paddle like nobody's business. And the, the guy could flat out light you on fire. And I was not a good kid, and I got lit on fire multiple times. And so I determined I was going to get rid of that paddle. And I took it out behind the church and one time, and, and I buried that paddle. And I was so happy. I, and I, I know he, he uh, uh, thought or suspected me, so... And things were fine for about six months. Then we decided, the church decided to build a new auditorium, and they dug up that paddle. <laughs> so, just a thought. <laughs> Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. There was one person who could wield a paddle better than the principal, though that was my dad. So sometimes the principal would just say, I told your dad. <laughs> and that was worse. Galatians chapter 5, we'll be reading verses 16 through 26, but I want to talk a little bit about something first before we read that. And let's open up in a word of prayer. Father, we come before you uh, this morning. We're thankful for your salvation. Thankful that you love us and care for us. Appreciate the love that you continue to show us. Appreciate the attention you continue to show us. I mean, we're just little peanuts down here, and you're the God of the universe, yet you continually give us your attention, constantly drawing us back to you and, and working out your salvation in us. Hearing our prayers interacting with us, and we just appreciate that. We love you very much. I pray, Lord, you please bless this message. Help me to say the words that you would have me say. Please accompany my words with your spirit. Please forgive my sins. Cleanse my heart. And, uh, and empower this message to bring about what you would bring about in this service. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So last week, uh, last week I taught on the uh, a lesson entitled, Why Can't I Live Consistently for Jesus Christ? And today I'm going to be teaching a lesson on the title, How to Live Consistently for Jesus Christ. Last week I taught on the differences between the body, soul, and spirit. Now could you, sh it's not on. Right, it's on mute. Okay. Can you show that picture of body, soul, and spirit up there? I taught on the differences between body, soul, and spirit. Uh, showed that the body is, uh, is world conscious, our physical body is, and it relates to the environment, relates to the outside world. Our soul is uh, self-conscious and it relates to others. And our spirit is God conscious and relates to God. Um, full disclosure, that's a model. How accurate it is? The Bible's not completely sure. I mean, there are serious theologians who say that we're just body and soul. Um, and they've got verses that, that, that give somewhat of a case for it. But even they have to concede that if we're just body and soul, there's a part of the soul that is self-conscious and a part of the soul that is God-conscious. And the part that is self-conscious is, doesn't really like God. And the part that is God-conscious is pretty small in us. So it works out the same way and this is the way I think the Bible, I think this is an accurate way, but I can see this is just a model. But there are, in fact, three aspects of us that the Bible talks about. We have a body, and we have a soul, or at least part of a soul, that is at enmity with God. It is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. And we have a, a part of us, the Bible calls spirit, that is where God dwells, and is the place where we, ha where we, we must worship. Um, Jesus said uh, uh, that we're to uh, 
but that the Father seeks those to worship him in spirit and in truth. So this is just a model. I think this is the closest to how the Bible describes it, but there are serious Christians who don't agree with this model completely, although they concede the primary points of it. So just full disclosure. But I show that the body is conscious of the outside world. It relates to the outside world. The soul is self-conscious and relates to others. And the spirit is God-conscious and relates only to his or her creator. You have a spirit, and that's part of who you are. Your, part of your consciousness is your spirit. And your spirit is related to God. In other words, it's like a radio that only has one channel. You can only converse with and hear from God in your spirit. So that before a person is saved, that's a kind of a miserable part of your body. Because it's got no way to grow. It doesn't relate to others. It relates to God. And if, you know, worshiping a false god doesn't fit the parameters of your, of your spirit. It's like someone said, uh, we have a God-shaped hole in our heart that only God can fill. And that's very true. Uh, your spirit is designed for God. It's where God communicates. So, while our body may be developed with habits and patterns, and our soul may be developed with habits and patterns, and emotions of thoughts and, and will, until we're saved, our spirit is undeveloped, is weak, and is small. Now, when we get saved, our spirit is recreated and made alive. In 1 Peter 1.23, the Bible says, Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. When we get born again, we are made alive. Our spirit is made alive. Okay? In Ephesians 4.24, it says, And that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. That spirit is recreated in righteousness and holiness. Now, there's a part of our soul that is not. Maybe our entire soul that is not. It is at enmity with God. It doesn't like it. So while we have our spirit that is created in righteousness and true holiness that knows God, our soul is still pretty much unconverted and is at enmity with God. 1 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature or creation. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things are become new. So there's this change, there's this creation that comes when a person trusts Jesus Christ as their Savior. I mean... It's pretty powerful, and we see it when it happens. Um, I remember the first time I actually really noticed that. Uh, I was a, in, in high school, and I was rebellious, and I wasn't saved, and I wasn't the most rebellious person in the school, but I was pretty close. And there was one girl named Melody Harmon who was, she was like the queen of, of rebels in the, in, in, the, uh, in the school. She would do what she wanted to do, when she wanted to do it, how she wanted to do it all the while trying to avoid Mr. Groff, that principal I was telling you about, because he was an equal opportunity spanker. And, uh, but she was rebellious. And we all knew it. And we had fun with her. She was a blast. Um, her soul related very well to our rebellious souls. Then one day we had, a, had a, uh, uh, an evangelist, a guy named Dan Hawtrey came and preached. And, and his wife would sing and she was a good singer, but she was kind of funny because she would always overemphasize the last syllables of, uh, of, of, of the songs that we sing. Remember that? Yeah. <laughs> his I is on the sparrow. We thought that was hilarious. But uh, Dan Hawtrey preached, and he preached his heart out and gave an invitation, and Melody Harmon went forward, and she trusted Christ as her Savior. And she was not the same melody after that. And we tried to get her to be saved, the same melody she was, but she wasn't going there. She was saved. She loved Jesus. It was like, whoa, what in heaven's name is this new birth? I've heard about it, but I've never seen it. And that was one of the things that I eventually, or uh, a few months later, caused me to get saved. But that's that new birth. That's something that happens to us. We are born again in our spirit. And when that happens, our sins are washed away by the blood of Jesus Christ, and we are joined to Jesus Christ. 
Okay? When we get saved, we are joined to Jesus Christ. Permanently, eternally. You are not your own. You're bought with a price, the Bible says. And it's a very real thing. This joining you have, this love you have for Jesus Christ is permanent and it's eternal. You are with Jesus Christ, and you will be with Jesus Christ forever. In heaven, Jesus Christ is going to be overwhelmingly the most important person with whom we interact. Say, I really love my family. Yeah, you will. And you won't love them any less. In fact, you're going to love them more. You're going to love them perfectly. But Jesus Christ is going to be the focus of our attention. See, we're joined to Jesus Christ. And it says in 1 Corinthians 6, 17, but he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Okay? Our spirit is joined unto the spirit of Christ. Romans 8, 10, and if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. So, although it's small and undeveloped when we get saved, our spirit becomes the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit indwells us, the Spirit of Christ indwells us, <coughs> and thus is very powerful. And it begins to exert great influence over our body and our soul. We begin thinking new thoughts. We begin saying new things. We begin cutting sin out of our life. We begin doing new things. Like I asked my dad years ago. I said, Dad, you know, you got saved when I was two years old. What was the first thing you noticed was different about you after you got saved? He said, well, I grew up in a household of an atheist, and I went to, the, went to um, worked, was in the Navy, and uh, I had, a, I had a, a blasphemous tongue. I could not stop taking God's name in vain. I couldn't do it. Now, at one point, I heard a message and the only thing I remembered of that message as a child was, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. So I, at a certain level, knew it was wrong. And eventually, when I was in the Navy, I tried to stop. And I had a, uh, uh, a roommate uh, with me, and, and we decided, okay, look, he, he said, uh, I told him, if you uh, hear me take God's name in vain, I want you to slug me right square in the jaw. And if I hear you take God's name in the vain, I'll slug you right square in the jaw. And they slugged away. But it didn't work. <laughs> Neither one could stop. <laughs> it was just in them. So when I was two years old, Dad got saved. He trusted Christ as a Savior. And the first thing he noticed was something happened. He said, well, praise the Lord. He stood back and said, yeah, where in the world did that come from? I've never said that before in my life. And anybody who knew him after that, to the day of his death, praise the Lord was always coming out of his mouth. I remember we buried my, my mom. Um, I was 30 years old at the time, and we buried her, and it was an incredibly sad day. Um, and we just put her in the ground, and Dad was ripped up with grief. And a very sad car, as, as, we, all, as we drove out of there, and, and as we pulled out of the cemetery on the road, Dad said, well, praise the Lord. And that was Dad's go-to statement. No matter what happened, it was, praise the Lord, or... Praise the Lord, you know. But that started when he got saved. Completely transformed. So our spirit becomes a very powerful influence on us, but it also finds there is a great opposition to what it wants to change. How many of you notice that? That your spirit has a lot of opposition. When you, you guys awake? <laughs> Raise your hand. <laughs> if that's you. Is, is that you or are you... If you have some level of, super, of, of spirituality, I'm not aware. <laughs> so I need to talk to you about that. <laughs> but it's, our, our, our spirit gets great opposition from our, our flesh, our body, and our soul. And it doesn't like the changes the Holy Spirit is directing us to make. In Galatians 5.17 says, For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other, so you cannot do the things that you would. Romans 8, 7, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the laws of God, law of God, neither indeed can be. So both the soul and the body resist the lordship of Jesus Christ in our spirit. 
And the effect is, we have an inconsistent life. We serve God, and we're tempted, and we fall into sin. And we repent, and we serve God, and temptation comes, we fall into sin. You see, And that's a, a common occurrence in the Christian life. In fact, especially in the early part of the Christian life, that is the overwhelming uh, 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 thing that happens to the new Christian. As you get older, you can begin to get more victory, but that's, that's a very common thing. So how do we change that? That's how we, why we live inconsistently for Christ, but how do we change that? How do we go from living inconsistently to living more and more consistently? You're never going to live completely consistently. It's not going to happen. We're going to be battling our sin nature till the day we're resurrected. Just, that's just the way it is. But how can we live more consistently? How can we be gaining victory over sin? And that's what I want to talk about today. How to get to live consistently for Jesus Christ. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16 <clears throat> we read, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. But if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Verse 16 again, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. The answer to living an inconsistent life is not trying to live a consistent life. Not trying, okay, my big problem here is this sin. I'm going to try. Well, yeah, you should try. A agreed. But that's not going to get you the victory. That's not going to get you the victory. The Bible tells us what gets us the victory. It's a consistent walking in the Spirit. Okay? consistently walking in the Spirit. That means when you get up in the morning, you walk in the Spirit. That means when you start work, you're still walking in the Spirit. That means when you're uh, at lunchtime, you're still walking in the Spirit. That means when it's 3 o'clock and you're going home, you're still walking in the Spirit. That means when you get home, you're still walking in the Spirit. It means a consistent walking in the Spirit. And if we do that, the Holy Spirit grows our spirit and we begin to have a more and more consistency. So what does it mean to walk in the Spirit? How do we do that? What are the practical steps I can take to start walking in the Spirit? There's a story I've heard for years from pastors about an Indian who got saved. And later on he was describing to the pastor what it was like being a Christian now. He says it's like two dogs fighting in my heart. Got a white dog, got a black dog. And the pastor asked him, said, well, who wins? The Indian said, well, whoever I feed the most. That's who wins. Where do you walk? Who do you feed? Your spirit or your flesh and your soul? Well, the Bible tells us, gives us activities that are spiritual activities. Okay? That is, if we do these things, if we fill our lives with these things, our spirit is going to grow. And we're going to have more power over sin. And we're going to enjoy Jesus' presence. And we're going to love Jesus more than we did before. It's kind of like a person who sends $100 a month into his 401k. After about 40 years, he's got quite a, quite a bit in there. 
it's not like it's a huge, fast growth, but it is a consistent growth. So what are these activities? I want to take a look at some of these activities here. Let's go to Revelation chapter 1, verse 10. Revelation 1, verse 10. How many here want to have your spirit grow to the point where you can live a much, much more consistent life? Is that you? Seriously, raise your hand if that's you. That's what I'm dealing with here. Okay, good. Praise the Lord for that. Revelation 1.10. This will actually be of great help. Revelation chapter 1, verse 10. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. And we heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. So what was going on there? The Apostle John, and I imagine probably not on his own. I imagine he's been in the Isle of Patmos for a while. He's led several to the Lord. And he has a church service on, on, on Sundays. And on Sunday, which is the Lord's Day, the Bible says he was in the Spirit. When we go to church, we are interacting with the Holy Spirit. Okay? Understand that. When we go to church, we are interacting with the Holy Spirit. Um, sometimes we interact more and sometimes less, but going to church is a spiritual activity. There is interaction with the Holy Spirit. This feeds our spirit. 1 Corinthians 1.18. Talked about this last week. It says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Worshiping God in church is very powerful, and it grows your spirit. It's very powerful. How many here, this is my experience. I've been saved for 40 plus years, about 43 years now. Um, no, 45 years. Okay, 45 years. And I've noticed something consistently throughout my spiritual life. Monday mornings and, and, and throughout the day Monday, temptation doesn't bother me nearly as much as it does on Friday. <coughs> How many have something similar? That's simply a fact. Throughout the day Monday, temptation doesn't bother me nearly as much as it does on Friday. In fact, generally on Tuesday or on Wednesday afternoon, it's bugging me again, and it's a good thing we got Wednesday night service. What's going on? There's power in church. I mean, seriously, there's power in church. There's a power in church you don't get from reading the Bible, that you don't get from praying, that you don't get from other aspects of Christian life. Those things are good, and they, there is power there. But there's a very, very heavy power in church. If we want to live the Christian life, it's important, it's vital even, that we're consistent in church. It's vital. You get more power there than any one other thing that you do. I've noticed I'll, I'll be in church and all of a sudden I have to use the restroom. <laughs> it's kind of funny. Uh, my dad had a, uh, invited me to preach at his, his service. Now the Spanish service there at Riverview Baptist they had a very long pre-service song service and, and uh, uh, announcements, and then they would have spe they had all kinds of special singers. And that the pre-service of the Spanish church could last upwards of an hour. So here I am, I'm sitting on the platform, and I didn't use the bathroom before I got up there. And I had to eventually get up and walk out and go use the rest and then come back on the platform. Super embarrassing. That's probably TMI, but it, it sure left a mark on me. <laughs> Pastor Yanson, what's going on? So, all right, you know, you got to do what you got to do. Um, so, but we're in the service and we're worshiping God, and our spirit is being ministered to by the Holy Spirit very powerfully. But we have to use the bathroom, so we go out there and walk out the door, and we walk out the door, and the door shuts behind us, and there is a noticeable difference. Have you noticed, how many of you noticed that? There's a palpable difference between being in here and being outside the door. Yes, sir. There's a difference. Yes, sir. Yeah, you can sit out there in the foyer. Or yeah, you can sit out there in the other room. That's good. But if you want 
the Holy Spirit to really minister you and, and, and to strengthen you and to grow you. Be in here. Be consistent. Um, and participate. <laughs> but the point is, is there's power here you're not going to get anywhere else. If you want to be consistent. The first step is be consistent in church. Be here every time the door is open. Let the Holy Spirit minister to you. Let the Holy Spirit work on you. Let the Holy Spirit grow you. Let the Holy Spirit speak to you and get sin out of your life. Come forward. Pray. There's a level of power in church that's not elsewhere. That's my experience. I've been around a while on this. Like I said, temptation has always been much weaker on, on Mondays. Prayer is always easier on Mondays. <clears throat> Thinking spiritual thoughts throughout the day, keeping myself uh, uh, focused on Jesus Christ throughout the day on, on Monday is always easier. Because there's a power there. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. Verse 18. And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. These are all spiritual activities. And these are activities that bring us in connection with the Holy Spirit. Okay? Fellowship that is centered on the Lord Jesus Christ is a spiritual activity that grows our spirit in the Holy Spirit. And, you know, fellowship is fine. Sometimes we have fellowship and talk about our jobs. That seems to be the default thing that we as men do anyway. I noticed the default position for women is to talk about their pregnancies and deliveries. <laughs> but anyway, the, uh, uh, I'm talking about fellowship that's centered on our Lord Jesus Christ. Where we talk about Jesus. I, I remember multiple times um, I'll be depressed, I'll be down, I'll be under temptation, and I'll come across a Christian. See, there's someone I, who I knew was saved before or I didn't know, but in conversation with them, I find out they're Christian, and we just start rejoicing in the Lord. And I walk away strengthened and able to resist temptation more, able to praise God with, with uh, 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 genuineness more. That fellowship that's centered on our Lord Jesus Christ is a spiritual activity. One thing about churches, and I've, I've noticed this in just about every church I've been to, we talk to each other about everything but Jesus Christ. Now, seriously, we have conversations about all kinds of things, only rarely have conversations about Jesus Christ. Now think about that. We ought to have more conversations about Jesus Christ. And just say, well, this is what God's been doing in my life. And how about you? And what's Jesus Christ mean to you? And and those kind of conversations. For whatever reason, we find that maybe they think it's too personal or something. We don't do it. We kind of keep things light. But as Christians, it's important that we have conversations about Jesus Christ. It's important that we fellowship around Jesus Christ with other believers. There's power there. That puts us in contact, and we are interacting with the Holy Spirit. Uh, some more things here. Verse 19, speaking to yourself in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Sing hymns throughout the day. I remember I used to, uh, I was working in Vancouver and I would drive home every day. I was a young man. I had all kinds of temptation going on in my life, in my thought life. 
And one of the things I found very helpful is I would sing hymns on my way home. And people would look at me, because <laughs> here I am, I'm singing at the top of my lungs with my window open, and, and uh, but sing, sing to the Lord. That's a spiritual activity. That puts you in contact with the Holy Spirit. That's part of walking in the Spirit. Uh, we go on here, verse 20. Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. <coughs> Thanking our Lord Jesus Christ for his goodness. Throughout the day. Lord, thank you for that. Lord, thank you for speaking to me. Lord, thank you for the Bible. Lord, thank you for your church. Lord, thank you for your salvation. But that puts us in contact, and we are interacting with the Holy Spirit. I mean, the way to get a consistent Christian life is to walk in the Spirit. That's part of God's salvation. Uh, the Bible describes in Romans chapter 11 uh, two aspects of God's salvation. Uh, that one... He forgives our sins, washes us clean, and we are justified and righteous before God and on our way to heaven. The second one is God turns us away from sin. Okay? The first one is legal. That gives us the right to be in heaven with Christ's righteousness attributed to us. The second one is a gradual change whereby we are sanctified. Okay? And every born-again Christian wants sanctification. Everybody wants to sin less. Amen? Amen. That's, that's, that's who we are as born-again Christians. We don't like our sin. Our flesh likes our sin. Our soul likes our sin. But our spirit don't like it. Once we get victory, we have to walk in the spirit. Live our life in Jesus Christ. And part of that is giving thanks. These are all things that we do throughout the day to keep ourselves walking in the Spirit. Another one here. And this is a tough one. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Oh, my. Submitting ourselves to each other is interacting with the Holy Spirit. That's a spiritual activity. Submitting ourselves to each other. That means thinking of others more highly than we think of ourselves. It's not dominating over people. Like for example, not dominating conversations. Letting the other guy talk. Listen to him. Think about what he has to say. I'm preaching that one to myself. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18. <clears throat> Praying always with all prayer and supplications in the Spirit. Okay? Praying. Spending time in prayer every day. Now we have our devotions. We spend some time in prayer, presumably, when we have devotions. But the Bible also tells us to pray without ceasing. That is, obviously you can't pray without ceasing throughout the day. You, got, you have to occupy your mind with all kinds of things for, uh, for survival and such. But what it means there is to be consistently talking to Jesus throughout the day. In, interact with Jesus Christ throughout the day. Be praying. That is interacting with the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit. One of the big, and this is a real blessing to me this, this last week, one of the big problems to prayer is Satan talks to us and he eventually convinces us that our prayers are useless. And we get depressed about praying. How many have ever got depressed about praying? They pray and pray and pray and pray. Nothing seems to happen, all right? I'm getting depressed by people not raising their hands. <laughs> um, but Satan tells us our prayers are useless and a waste of time. But in fact, and pay attention here, in fact, Every time we pray, every time we pray, we are interacting with the Holy Spirit. Every single time. Let's go to Romans chapter 8. Let's take a look at this. When I got a hold of this this last week, I just almost turned Pentecostal. 
Romans chapter 8, verse 26. <clears throat> so we, here we are, we're praying, and we think nothing's happening. We think it's useless. But yeah, God told me to pray, so I've got to keep on praying. And, uh, and we're buying into Satan's lie that nothing's going on. But here's what is actually going on that we don't see. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. So here we are praying, and the Holy Spirit is right beside us interceding for us. Praying, if you will. Interceding with groanings which cannot be uttered. This last, uh, yesterday actually, I, I was, uh, I went to Redleaf, and there were four police officers uh, having a cup of coffee there, so I've got a track that I, I have. It's, uh, and by the way, this is a really cool wallet just for tracks, and you see Brother Stu, he can probably get you one. He got this for me. But this is a track, it's called the a An Atheist Who Met God. And it's a police officer who was an atheist, who was a detective, and he, trust, and, and he um, investigated Jesus Christ and became a Christian. But it's a great track to give to police officers. They generally are really interested in that. So I walked up to them and introduced myself and, and invited them to church and gave them each of these tracks. And I walked away, and, so I, and I started praying for them. Lord, would you please bring, the, bring salvation to them? I said, no, nah, they're not going to get saved. Nothing's going to happen with them. They're just going to laugh at you as you walk away. and they, were, they pretended to be interested, but they're not interested. Nothing's going to happen. Nothing ever happens. But I thought of this verse. I said, Holy Spirit, I'm kind of discouraged on this. Would you pray alongside me? Would you intercede for me and cause something to happen here? See? When we get discouraged, ask the Holy Spirit to intercede. He's a much better prayer than you are. <laughs> See? And he promises to do so. But when we pray... We are interacting with the Holy Spirit. That's part of walking in the Spirit. Okay? It's a matter of where do we live our lives. Do I live my life in my soul where I'm focused on the world? Well, to a degree, you can't avoid that. Because we have to survive. We have to pay the bills. We have to interact. We have to know what's going on. But at the same time, we can walk in the Spirit a whole lot more than we do. Amen? Or oh me. You know, it's, we, we can. We can do that. And the Bible says if we do that, we're going to get more and more consistently consistency in our Christian life. Prayer is a spiritual exercise. That strengthens and grows our spirit. It's a method of walking in the spirit. Let's go to first first Peter chapter one, verse twenty three. 1 Peter 1.23. Look at something else. And we're going to end on this. I've got quite a few more points, but we're going to end on this. It says, Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. The Bible says there are two forces that come into our life that birth us in Jesus Christ. John chapter 3 says it's the Holy Spirit. 1 Peter 1 says it's the Word of God. Those two forces come together in our life and we are born again. Okay? And the Word of God is food for our spirit. All right? That's simply a fact. The Word of God is food for our spirit. When we are in the Word of God, we are interacting with the Holy Spirit. For example, uh, we read in Ephesians 5, it talks about the sword of the Spirit. When we interact with the Word of God, we are interacting with the Holy Spirit. So those are four things. There's quite a few more. But things which when we do, we interact with the Holy Spirit. And we need to spend our day as much as we can, walking in the Spirit. That means shutting out the TV. That means all kinds of things that often we do. But we need to spend our time 
especially a, a, at least a much more amount of our time walking in the Spirit. Because one of the problems we have as Christians is that we are inconsistent. All right, well, let's pray here. Father, we come before you this morning and just pray, please bless this message. Help us to learn to walk in your spirit and begin to see more and more consistency, see more and more victory. And uh, just ask you to bring these points to our, our, our minds throughout the week so it doesn't just go away when we leave this building today. But thank you for this opportunity. In Jesus' name, amen.